Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Selena Wright, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer for the Inside Out Programs. We are so excited that you're here joining us today for the SLP Four-Step Sensory Solution. We've been looking forward to bringing this content to you and can't wait to hear how you benefit. I'd like to introduce Jesse Ginsburg, Sensory Integration Trained SLP. Hello, everyone, and welcome. And we are so excited for today. Today, we are going to bring you such great information that truly will transform your practice. So if you are an SLP or if you're an SLPA, you are in the right place. We cannot wait to get you this information. So like Selena said, I am a sensory integration trained SLP, use sensory strategies with every single one of my speech sessions. I own a private practice in Los Angeles, and I also am the creator of the Inside Out Sensory Certificate for SLPs, which is the only sensory certificate that exists for SLPs. And we have sensory trained clinicians all over the globe, and we are just so thrilled to be getting this information into the hands of more people and really getting it to a place where it is more accessible. So let's go ahead and jump into today. I will tell you that the way that this whole training came to be was this thought that I hear all the time, which is for some reason, we always get therapists coming to us saying, I have this kid and he's always melting down in class or we're seeing all these really big behaviors. What can I do to help? And my answer is always the same, which is, how can we be more proactive in helping our kids regulate and less reactive? And for some reason, there's this crazy thought and an approach that everyone uses, which is let's work this kid as much as we possibly can and do as much as we possibly can with him. And then when he's dysregulated, then we'll give him a break, right? It's always like the break is the afterthought. But in reality, there are so many ways that we can be proactive in supporting a child's regulation. And ultimately, not only is this going to help you in your sessions because your kids are going to come in more regulated and you're going to be more effective with your time, but it's also really going to help you build trust with your clients. And we know that the greater trust that we can build with our kids, the more progress they are going to ultimately make the safer they're going to feel, the more connected they're going to be. So that's why we cannot wait to bring you this information today. You guys met Selena, who introduced to kind of kick this whole thing off today. Selena is our COO of the Inside Out programs. And we also have Melanie Weber here. And many of you have probably heard from her already. But Melanie, you want to say hi? Yes. Hi, my name is Melanie. I'm the sensory program advisor for Inside Out and I'm a mom of a sensory seeker. So I'm just so excited to be here to help you learn this amazing information. Um, as a speech language pathologist, I am just so passionate about the sensory communication connection and I cannot wait to help you on your journey as you learn more about sensory. Great point in bringing up the children. We definitely, Selena also has a sensory seeker of her own at home. And I have oh my, one of everything basically now. Who knows what this latest baby is going to be, but I definitely have a sensory seeker. I definitely have a sensory avoider. And I have, I have kids with high thresholds, low thresholds. If you don't know what that is, don't worry, because we're going to talk about that this week. So our goal of today is talking about dysregulation we really need to be able to identify what does dysregulation look like? Because when our kids are dysregulated, that truly is such a barrier to us being able to do our best work. It's a barrier in us being able to see the kind of progress that we want to see in our sessions with our kids. So what we have for you is a workbook for today. So make sure you grab your workbook because you are going to see throughout this week that we have different ways for you to participate, different ways for you to learn. So everyone grab your workbook. If you want to use a fillable PDF version, you can absolutely do that if that is easier for you. And we are just going to dive right into talking about dysregulation versus regulation and what does that look like? 
So a lot of people know when a kid's dysregulated, they're moving around a lot. It's hard for them to focus and concentrate, but it's funny because I often get asked, but what will he look like when he's regulated? And funny enough, I actually get that question a lot from parents because parents are like, what's my goal here? Like, what am I looking to accomplish by doing these sensory strategies and, and doing these sensory activities? Like, what is the, what is my kid going to look like once we get to the place where he's regulated? And this is really what it looks like. Get your worksheets out. We're diving in here to the very beginning of three characteristics of a regulated child. And these are really just the three main things that I look for, three main signs that I will see in kids who are regulated. The first is that they are attentive. Okay, number one, a regulated child is attentive. Curveball, what does attentive mean? Okay, because a lot of times when we think of attention, our SLP brains automatically go back to grad school when we learned about joint attention. And, oh, well, if I look at him and he looks at me and he looks at the ball and I look at the ball and then we look at each other and, right, we're going through in our head, what does joint attention look like? Here's the thing. You may or may not know that joint attention for a neurotypical child can look very different than joint attention for an autistic child. And I will bet you... I don't know if I'd bet like my life on it, but at least, at least $20 will bet you that you did not learn about what autistic joint attention looks like in grad school. Okay. Because I really don't think it's something we talk about. And the thing is with our autistic kids, we may see them using less eye contact. So we may not see that they look at the toy, then they look at us and they look at the toy and then they look at us. They may just be looking at the toy most of the time. Okay, I had a autist an autistic colleague tell me when <laughs> baby is in the house, you guys can probably hear him. We always joke on our team. It's baby goat. Baby goat is here. He is being very noisy right now, eating. So good times. Okay, so I had an autistic colleague tell me that when her husband points to something across the room, she looks at his finger and she draws a line in her head in the air to figure out what he's pointing at, okay? And I'm not saying that every autistic person does that. I'm saying that that's an example of how joint attention might look different. Being able to look at where someone is pointing may be a learned skill for our kids, not just something that they develop through our experiences. So I will tell you, think about when we're thinking of number one key characteristic of a regulated child, that child is attentive. What does attentive mean? Okay, that's the first thing to think about and really think about what the difference between autistic joint attention and neurotypical joint attention. Okay, number two key characteristic that a child is regulated is that they are engaged, okay? And that just means that they're connected with you. And generally when I talk about engagement, I mean that they are going back and forth in interaction with you. So is your interaction with that child continuous? Okay, so number two, is the child engaged? And you might describe that as being connected, going back and forth, interact, interacting with you, participating in the activity with you. Is that child engaged? And the last one of the key characteristic that a child is regulated is, are they learning? Are they communicating with you? But I really just would say learning is the biggest thing. Is that child attending to what you're doing? Are they engaged with what you're doing? And are they learning? And there are going to be signs that they are learning. And a lot of times those signs will be that you are seeing that the child is communicating with you, whether that's through nonverbal means, whether that is through verbal means, whether that's through a device that they are starting to communicate with you. So number three is the child learning. So something that we really wanted to focus on today is Gestalt language processing. And the reason for that is because 
what we know is that the majority of autistic kids are Gestalt language processors and our language approaches for these kids are going to be different than our standard um, approaches for kids who are analytic language learners. So we really wanted to talk about how can you tell if a child is dysregulated when they are a Gestalt language processor. We're gonna talk about both kids who are not and kids who are, but um, I am going to pass this one over to Melanie because this is really her area of expertise. And although I think most SLPs are starting to get more familiar with Gestalt language processing, maybe Melanie, you could like sum it up for us in a quick couple of sentences. Yeah, absolutely. So Gestalt language development, let's just say, let's just start off clear. This is a completely normal way to develop language. You know, in grad school, we were taught about language development, where you learn one word at a time. Gestalt language development is the basic unit of language is a chunk of language, and it usually has very rich intonation. And this is usually referred to as echolalia. So you've probably heard the term echolalia. Any kid who communicates through echolalia is likely a Gestalt processor. So they are more focused on whole chunks and intonational patterns than they are individual words, I guess is the best way to sum it up. Awesome. So we are going to be talking about four signs that a child is dysregulated. And we'll give you a couple of signs that you might see in all kids, whether they are GLPs, Gestalt language processors or not. But Melanie, you want to kick us off with the first one, first sign? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So the first sign that a child could be dysregulated is that they are non-speaking. And we do know there are a lot of reasons a child can be non-speaking, but we have found that a lot of them are non-speaking because they're dysregulated. So I would definitely look to see you know, if your child is non-speaking, just be curious and be open to the possibility that they might be dysregulated. Absolutely. I think that's something that is also a cause of stress for so many therapists is this, I haven't gotten any language from this child, whether it is verbal or not, whether it's AAC or they're working on spoken language, right? That can be a very big source of stress for, for therapists. It puts so much pressure on us. And we have found through working with thousands of therapists that this is huge, is when a child is non-speaking and uh, that could be due to dysregulation. And I will say um, not just non-speaking, but also not communicating, right? I don't wanna um, say only that they might only be dysregulated if they're not using spoken language. We may not see a lot of communication through other means like AAC as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that makes sense from what we know of autistic adults who say when they're overstimulated, it's just, it's hard. And that would be hard with verbal speech or with any AAC or any type of communication attempt. It's, it's challenging. So, you know, if a child is non-speaking, they may be dysregulated. Um, another sign is that they may be plateauing or making limited progress. Um, we see kids come in all the time and it's like, especially our Gestalt processors, they, they learn a lot of good Gestalts and they use them, but then it just kind of tailors off. And so just keeping in mind, if there is a plateau, the brain does not plateau. It doesn't stop learning, but that's usually a sign that there is something else impeding learning. So may, they could be dysregulated and that's why you're seeing the limited progress being made. Yeah. And I love this one, not love this for my clients, but I love this one because this is another big pain point and stressor for therapists is um, we feel like, okay, we're getting somewhere with this kid. And then all of a sudden it's like progress becomes very, very slow. And We've all had the parents in, in the clinic or the parents who come in and observe a session and they're like, I just don't feel like, you know, what's next for him? And he's been doing this for a long time. He's been saying these words for a long time. Like, when are we going to see more from him? I feel like we've all had parents come to us and say that. And same thing with plateauing, like where we feel like, gosh, we're doing the same things every time and we're not seeing any 
you know, continued results. And that can be something that's really stressful for us. And a lot of times that's what we see is that if they're dysregulated, a lot of the times those small moments where they are regulated, maybe they're learning and picking up new things, but the majority of the time when they're dysregulated, it's very hard for us when we're dysregulated to learn language, which we will talk more about shortly, but um, okay, awesome. And so number one, just to recap for our, those of you taking notes is being non-speaking. Number two, plateauing or making limited progress. All right, Melanie, what's number three? Number three, this is really specific to our GLPs, our Gestalt processors, but the use of an emotional script is a really good indicator they're dysregulated. So I had a client, this took me months to figure this out. So I don't want you to think, well, she's so awesome, months. But he had this very specific script that I finally put together he was using when he was anxious and he was just listing all the things that made him anxious. And he was 17 for context, but he would go vampires, Halloween, nightmare before Christmas. And I finally realized that that script was really a, you know, him communicating to me, I'm like at my limit. So I realized that's when he was dysregulated and we worked on giving him a script, you know, I need a break. And he would go, I need a break, wide iPad, please, because that's what he always got when he got a break in other therapies. And it was just so good to put that together. And I felt so accomplished when I figured that out. So I want you to, when you're taking language samples for Gestalt processors, start thinking about the context because they may be communicating to you that they're dysregulated, but from what we know on Gestalt processors, their language is not always literal. Yeah, and it's one of those things where, and I, people who are starting to get familiar with Gestalt language processing will know this. For those of you who don't, we know that a lot of times kids' scripts may appear to be out of context. We're like, what? Like Melanie, like, like, wait, it's, it's April. Why are we talking about vampires and Halloween and nightmare before Christmas? Like she could easily be like, oh, nightmare before Christmas. You're excited. Christmas is coming up. Right. But the words may have no actual connection with what the intention is behind the words. It might just be the emotion that is connected to the script, which is trying to, where they're trying to convey this emotion that they're having or where they are displaying the emotion that they're having. All right, so using emotional scripts. And what's the last one? Again, this is really specific to Gestalt processors, but reverting back to earlier stages can be a sign they're dysregulated. So I've had clients come in before and we were at stage four. And if you are familiar with Gestalt processing, that is where you start working on grammar. And my client came in one day and he only used echolalia, delayed echolalia, the whole session. He would sing Hickory Dickory Dock and that's all he would sing. And he had to go through the whole thing. And I asked mom, you know, how was his day today? And she said, oh, it's terrible. He woke up at 2 a.m. He wouldn't go back to sleep. It was picture day. They were out of their routine. There were all these things that happened. And so that clued me in that he had, by the time he came to my session at 4.30, he was incredibly dysregulated. So looking, taking good language samples and looking for patterns. If you have a client who's normally in stage four, and then one day it's like nothing but stage one utterances, or if they are you know, they seem to be making good progress. And then the next day, it's like all that progress is gone. It's probably not that the progress is gone. And it's not that you're doing anything wrong. It could just be that they are dysregulated. And so our focus then, instead of like Jesse said earlier, continuing to push to see like, well, why aren't you, you know, yesterday, it was so great. Maybe take a step back and focus on their regulation to help get them back to where they can be at those or the later stages that they are truly operating at. Absolutely. So we want this week to be very, we want this to be very much a week where you are able to take stuff away and start implementing it immediately. If there's one thing SLPs do not have, it is, what's your guess, Melanie? What do you think I'm going to say? Time? Yes. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. Okay. If there's one thing SLPs do not have an overabundance of, it is time. And this is not meant to have you go home and like, feel like you're studying and in order to get 
value out of this. We don't want you to have to put in extra work. We want you to show up here and then you get to go to your work and you get to start implementing everything you learn. So before we move into this next segment where we're going to talk about how you can support dysregulated kids and just FYI, this whole week is going to focus on this. So today we are dipping our toes in and then every day this week, we are going to be getting deeper and deeper and deeper, more strategies, more strategies. So we are going to slowly be building your toolbox all week. Okay, but before we jump into the portion on how we can help to support our kids, I want you to take a second and think about a child you really want to focus on. It can be just today, it can be for this week, and I will tell you the type of kid you want to focus on. Think about a kid who is the one taking all your time and energy, okay? I feel like we all have kids where we see them and we feel so stressed out because we don't know if we're doing the right thing. We don't know if we're helping them. And it's like the 80-20 rule, if any of you guys are familiar with that. It's like there's the one kid, there's 20% of your caseload taking up 80% of your mental energy. And I will never forget when I learned that lesson because I was having lunch with Jake Greenspan, who is the founder of the Floor Time Center. If you guys know Floor Time Therapy, his dad was the one who, you know, created Floor Time Therapy essentially. And I was talking to him about kids that I was having trouble with. And he was the one who said, it is, you know, that one kid taking up so much space in your brain. It's 20% of your clients taking up 80% of your energy. What would you do if you had that 80% of your brain power left? And it was just like brain explosion emoji. I feel like we don't know how to talk anymore. The other day, Melanie, when you left um, a, a Vox, which is an audio message, Melanie said, LOL in it. Yeah, I, I think my husband and I, speaking of gestalt processing, I speak in a lot of movie scripts and, and GIFs now. <laughs> yes, and now I'm like, okay, brain explosion emoji. Okay, but seriously, what if you had 80% of your brain space back? That's pretty crazy to think about, but it's also crazy to think about that for a lot of us, it is true that it is a really small percentage of our caseload taking up that 80%. Okay, so we really want you to bring your challenging kids to us this week. Like we want to help you through those kids. Um, we want to get you the support that you need. And we want this to really make an impact on your practice every single week. So think about for a minute, one of those kids, and I want you to write that down. And that is the kid that we are going to start thinking about right now. And we're going to get some of your brain space back. All right, so let's get into what you can start to do now to start supporting your dysregulated clients. So the first thing you really need to know is what your client looks like when they're dysregulated. And one thing to think about, particularly with Gestalt language processors, is what are the scripts that they are using when they're dysregulated? Okay, so go back to your worksheet. Melanie, you want to hold it up and show it? Here it is. Okay, we are on the bottom section of that. Okay, so know their scripts. And Melanie, did you wanna share a little bit more about what that means? Yes, yeah, because it's so important to know their scripts. That's when we talk about working with a Gestalt processor, the very first thing we wanna do is be curious and identify their scripts. And we wanna identify not only, for some kids, we wanna figure out what are they saying? Cause it can be somewhat unintelligible. But then we want to figure out what is the true meaning, because they could be saying, you know, vampires, Halloween, nightmare before Christmas, when they really mean I'm anxious and I need a break. And so when you're writing down their scripts, also thinking about the context and trying to be that detective and figure out what they're trying to say. I had one client who I figured out he was a Gestalt processor. Actually, once I addressed his regulation, he was non-speaking, very minimally speaking when we started. And 
using some awesome sensory strategies, I one day it was just like a light switch and we had the best time and he loved to sing. So he was a super simple songs kid. He would sing all the songs. And one day he started singing Open Shut, which is a very popular, super simple songs. And then I was like, oh yeah, open and shut. And I went and got some box or something that you could open and close. And he was just getting incredibly more and more frustrated to the point he was crying and singing open shut. And then he finally grabbed me by the hand and took me to the door and put my hand on the doorknob. And I was like, oh, you want to leave? He was like, open shut. And I was like, okay. And I think we were at like 25 minutes anyway. I'm like, so we're done which was not the best thing for me. Cause then anytime he wanted to leave the room, he would just go open shut. But that I knew he wanted to open the door. He was telling me I'm ready to go. And I realized a lot of that was specifically when he was getting really overwhelmed. He was like, or even if he was bored, he's like, this is not fun. Open shut. Like I've got to get out of here. And it was just such a good reminder that you know, doing the detective work, figuring out why he was dysregulated. Thank goodness he showed me too. I mean, that was amazing. He was like two and a half and amazing that he was able to like, finally, like, come on lady, you have to get this. I'm ready to leave. But really making sure we know their scripts. Don't just take it at face value. Do that detective work and think about the context. Think about how they're saying it, not just what they're saying it. What is that emotion behind it too? Sometimes it's there and sometimes it's not, but we do know a lot of times our Gestalt processors have really good intonational patterns. So key in on that and start thinking, are you seeing a pattern of when they're saying a certain script, it is leading up to dysregulation? Yes. So when we don't know what they're trying to tell us, how are we going to fulfill that need, right? So if Melanie didn't know that open shut meant open and close the door, how are we possibly going to fill that need? So that's why it's so important for us to know their scripts, know what they mean in their scripts. Okay, number two is we want to co-regulate. Co-regulate means supporting the child with their regulation. It doesn't mean going, okay, you go into that room and come out when you're done crying. It means I'm going to help you. I'm going to share my calm with you. And we are going to work through this together to get you feeling better. So we want to help the child co-regulate both emotionally and physically. Okay, get out your worksheet. Co-regulate emotionally and physically. And I had to bring up emotional co-regulation because this is something that I see passed over so often. like. A therapist might describe that they have a kid who's crying every time they come into the session and all the therapist is doing is racking their brain, try to, trying to figure out what sensory inputs does this child not enjoy, but what kind of emotional experiences are contributing to this? Like maybe that kid just came from another clinic where they hated the the type of therapy and it was not fun for them and now they come to your clinic they assume it's going to be the same which is why they're crying right the reason they're dysregulated may not be a sensory reason it may be an emotional reason so the way that we um, help kids to co-regulate emotionally is really by being that calming supportive loving nurturing presence for them and the thing is like as easy as it sounds It can be really hard when we are with a kid who is stressed out, overwhelmed, really dysregulated, because we tend to feed off of other people's energies. We are humans. That is what humans do. So this is the time when we have to take a second. We need to take a breath and we need to think about what does that kid need in this moment? They need me to be their calming source for them. They need me to help them calm down. We want to be supportive, show them that we care, be loving, be nurturing. Those are all the things that we want to be for them. It's really, in this sense, so much more about just bringing the right kind of energy. It's how can we bring this comforting type of energy to this interaction? And a lot of the times that means using less language. You know, if they are using scripts, maybe we're going to, we're going to acknowledge their scripts and validate them. But a lot of times when we are trying to get kind of re-regulated, the less language we hear, the less we have to process, we're not in our logical thinking centers of the brain anyway, when we're dysregulated, 
and just being that calming presence there using less language and just really reassuring that child that we are there for them. <laughs> As I was talking, I was thinking about this little boy who, <laughs> oh my gosh. You know, those kids where you see them and you want to take them home. <laughs> You're like, I'm pretty sure you're my child or I really want you to be my child. I want to take you home and you see them and it's like, you just want to squeeze them because you love them so much. Okay, this is like that type of kid I'm like obsessed with in my clinic. And he came in one day and he was just crying and he is never cries. Like it's very, very unusual for him. And his nanny said to me, like, I don't know what's going on. I can't get him to tell me anything. He was a Gestalt language processor. He was like in between stages one and two. He had some language, but he was just so upset. And it was like my heart broke because I love this kid more than anything. So I spent like the first 10 minutes of the session just holding him like, I love you. I'm here for you. Not even saying that just that was like the energy I was bringing to this interaction. And I just like had him sit in my lap and I hugged him and he cried and I like held his little face. And uh, but that's what kids need from us. A lot of times, you know, they just need to know that someone cares. So, um, help them really think about their emotional state. That is absolutely not something that can be glossed over. A lot of our kids we know experience trauma, whether that is intentional trauma or not. And we want to make sure that they are feeling good. Ultimately, their well-being is what is number one to us. So think about how we can help them regulate emotionally. And the next is how can we help them regulate physically? So if it is dysregulation and due to sensory reasons, or sometimes we, it's not, but there are still sensory things that make us feel better. Right. So like maybe I'm crying cause I'm upset. And the reason I'm upset is not because of a sensory reason, but it still helps when I come up when, when my kids come up and give me a hug, right. Like getting that kind of connection and sensory input can still be really calming. So in this case, we really want to think of how can we help to calm our kids down. And we are going to be talking about this in depth, very looking at your clients in a very comprehensive way this whole week. Like I said earlier, this is just about getting your kind of toes wet. Okay, I'm the murderer of all metaphors. Is it toes wet, feet wet, dipping your toes in the water? You guys get what I'm trying to say. Okay, so generally speaking, when we are providing sensory input and we want to come at it in a calming way, we are going to be giving them sensory input that is very soft, slow, rhythmic, predictable. Okay, so those are the things we really want to think about. Soft. Is your voice like loud screaming energy or are we speaking with a very soft tone? Okay, um, things like when you're pushing on the swing, are we pushing them all big and getting them tons of input? Or are we trying to swing them slowly and rhythmically and softly with less intensity? Okay, so sometimes those big activities can still be really regulating. It's just the way that we are going to do them. So we really wanna think about soft, slow, keeping things rhythmic, keeping things predictable, um, you know, deep squeezes, using a soft voice, dimming the lights, rocking back and forth. Um, Melanie, do you have any go-to calming exercises you use? For my son, because I think this is so important that you bring this up. I think a lot of times people think about sensory strategies and they're thinking about running and jumping and they think of the alerting strategies. And as the mom of a sensory seeker, I do use a lot of alerting strategies, but at bedtime, if I want him to go to sleep, I cannot use big alerting strategies. I'm gonna use calming strategies to give him the input he needs, but kind of bring things down. So my son loves any type of deep pressure and like rolling him up like a little burrito in a blanket is one of his favorite things. If I could just like as tight as possible, it's like he's back in the womb. It's <laughs> like, he absolutely loves that. He also- The, 80, the 85th trimester. 
Yes, 100%. (laughs) Um, He also loves to swing in like a very calming, like front and back manner. We do a lot of swinging when I know that he needs input, but he needs to be more calm. And deep squeezes is another favorite of his. Any proprioceptive input he is like here for. So lots of deep pressure on his joints, big squeeze hugs. You know, he loves all those things. So those are some of my favorites because I use them a lot now. But I think, I know it's hard if you can't touch your clients. So maybe another one that I used to do in therapy is just to take your kid for a walk, like just going outside and walking and getting their body moving. If you're walking and not running and jumping, walking can be a very calming activity as well. Yeah, that's a good point. And also, you know, you kind of already brought this up a little bit and we're going to be talking about this a lot this week, but just ways you can change the environment, like even dimming the lights and things like that can make a really big difference if um, you can't necessarily use all of these sensory strategies. How about you, Selena? Yeah, along the same lines, I had a client who was a little bit older, about 15 years old. And uh, to call back to Jesse's point about predictability and environment, that was one of the first things I did before he even walked into the clinic. So my room had to be a vibe. Uh, Lights were dimmed, diffuser was on. Um, I had one of those little mini diffusers you can get at Amazon. I just stocked my room with that and um, would turn on a scent that I knew that he liked uh, so that when he came in, it was already this experiential situation. Um, Sitting at the table was not a preferred for this client. And to the point that when he would come into a room and thought he had to sit and do something structured at the table, even that, and whether that came from an emotional component or a, or a physical dysregulating component was a little bit of a mixed bag for us to determine as the team. But one thing that I found is the environmental modification of even making it visible that sitting at the table wasn't an option. So I didn't have chairs at the table and that communicated to him, we're not going to be sitting. So right when he came in, he didn't even have to wonder if I would be making him sit at the table or not. It was very obvious that we wouldn't be. Um, Unrestricted access to movement was big for me with him. Um, A yoga ball was there on the floor where we would be sitting. He could use it if he wanted to. When he would use it, he would use it very intensely. I remember from a recent Making the Shift episode, the live YouTube show that Chris and Jesse host, in one of the episodes, Jesse was talking about uh, pulling this business strategy uh, analogy. And one of the things she had said was sell them what they want, but give them what they need. And we do that with our clients often when it comes to sensory. So we sell them the sensory that they believe that they want or that they believe they need, but we're in uh, essence, giving them what they want. So I knew that if he would have unrestricted access to the yoga ball, he would bounce pretty hard on it, very alerting input. So then I would counterbalance it with the dim lights in the room or completely off altogether. Um, really calm music or no music at all. And and so you could see this counterbalance that would end up happening. And that was very calming to him as well. But the unrestricted access to that movement in and of itself, I think was calming for him because that put him in charge. He had this level of autonomy that he didn't typically have in other settings. Uh, So it's all of that that contributes. It's not often one thing. Um, But when you learn more about sensory and become informed in this area, Uh, it will start to become second nature to you. You'll start to understand. um, I think of it like, you know, those DJs that have the control boards with all that. You start to figure out what to amp up versus what to ramp down uh, for the benefit of your client. Okay, that is crazy. You just said that about the DJ board because Chris was just saying that like a week or two ago. He was like, I think of it more of like, uh, that's turntable, you know? which is so funny. Um, and also genius. Did everyone else catch what Selena said? Not even having chairs at the table to help your child understand we're not going to be sitting. Melanie's also freaking out. I see it in her eyes. Another um, brain explosion emoji for the day. Okay. But I just love that so much. And I love that you brought up the sell them what they want, give them what they need. We will be talking about that this week as well. Um, How do we give them what they want, which is their sensory preferences, but then also really think about their sensory system. What specifically do they need to be regulated and how can we do that? 
Okay, so feel free if you haven't yet, write down some examples of some of these strategies that you might want to try with that client of yours. We want you to at least have a few. You're going to have a very, very long list and plan by the end of the week, but try something tonight, like tonight when you're working at like eight o'clock, just kidding. Okay. Try something before tomorrow. If you can write something down and that could be as something as simple as I have a kid who comes in and seems like they're really dysregulated. So I'm going to sing our hello song really softly, and I'm going to give them squeezes while we sing it. I'm going to sing you guys my hello song because I feel like every time I mention a hello song, people ask me, okay, it goes like this, hello, Jesse, hello, Jesse, hello, Jesse, we're glad you came to play, okay, that's all, but I could sing it, hello, I... I lost my voice recently. You can hear it going in and out, but you can sing it really slow. Hello, Jesse. Sometimes I will whisper it. Okay. And that could be as simple as when I start my session, instead of coming at the kid, like it's time for speech, I'm going to come in and I'm going to be that calming source for this child. And I am going to sing really softly and give them deep squeezes and then see how that goes for your session. Okay, so let's do a, a quick chat. Let's have a quick chat about why this is so important, okay? You may be familiar with this concept of the language staircase, which is in your workbook. You have a copy of this. This is something you can feel free to share with others. We will go ahead and put in the chat also a link to download a version of this that you can share with your colleagues. And this is something that we encourage you to share because it will really help you in your practice. Okay, so the language staircase is what we will use and something I started drawing on a piece of paper with a Sharpie in my sessions to describe to parents why we needed to get our kids regulated before we could target communication or before we would really see consistent communication from our kids. Okay, so when you look at that language staircase graphic, you will see that the bottom step is regulation, and then we have engagement a little higher, then we have basic language, and then we have higher level language and cognitive skills. Okay, so we have to think about the base of that staircase is regulation. We have to get kids regulated if we want to get them communicating. Okay, and this is neurology. This is how our brain works. Our brain has one very important function, which is the number one function of all brain functions, which is to survive. <laughs> it's to keep us safe. And when we are dysregulated, our brain automatically goes into this defense mode, this protection mode, where it shuts down all of the other brain functions so that it can focus on us surviving. So when we are dysregulated, if you guys are familiar with this concept of the downstairs brain, which is where those survival instincts are versus the upstairs brain is where all of our logical thinking happens. When we're dysregulated, we are trapped in that downstairs part of our brain. We cannot get upstairs to access the language that we have, okay? This is why when you say no to a two-year-old, I was going to give a situation, but it literally doesn't matter. It's just anytime you say the word no to a two-year-old, they throw their body on the ground. And then that's, there's no negotiating. There's no like, tell me what's wrong. What if we do this instead? It's just cry, cry, cry. And that's because they are not accessing that part of their brain where they're even processing, processing, processing mom brain you trying to come up with ways to solve this problem for them. Okay, so our job as SLPs, is that a downstairs brain job, language and communication or upstairs? It's very much upstairs, right? It's language, it is play, it is logical thinking and cognitive skills. It is all the stuff on the upstairs. And when our kids are not regulated, we simply cannot get up there to get to do our job effectively. So that's why it is so important for us. Okay, so 
feel free to use this analogy, um, send it to anyone you want, explain it to parents when you are working with their kids. And if you click that link, and we can drop it in the chat one more time, if you click that link to grab the training handout, we will also send you a link to a video where we talk about the language staircase in more detail if that is something that you haven't really gotten to feel super confident yet, with yet and you want to um, listen. Okay, so let's circle back to the whole point of today, which is how can we start being more proactive with sensory needs and less reactive? I will tell you, I learned more from creating the sensory certificate course and then bringing therapists into it than I could have ever imagined. And one of the greatest blessings and one of the things that I have been so grateful to have been able to learn is getting feedback from autistic SLPs who have gone through my course. And I have autistic SLPs who are friends now who originally signed up for this course, my course, because they wanted to help their clients and they had no idea that it would actually help them so much. One of those people is a friend of mine. You guys may know Jamie Boyle. She is an autistic SLP. And I just remember talking to her in great detail and her saying that she basically has gone through her whole life. She's in her mid thirties right now. She's basically gone through her whole life, just like tolerating all of the sensory information coming in throughout the day and then milk. And after she went through my course and she started to learn, wow, I can be really proactive with my own sensory system and what my needs are. And I can, I can actually advocate for those needs, right? She says, how great is it to be able to go into every day, be able to ask for the things that I need, and accommodations that I need and go home and not have a meltdown, right? So these are things that really do truly have an impact on the kids we are serving. And it's just one of those things that here we are, people in their like 30s, adults, just learning this and just learning how to better support their sensory needs, right? Going through their whole lives, feeling uncomfortable throughout the day, overwhelmed throughout the day, dreading that they're going to come home and melt down and how incredible is it that with these simple I mean complex yes but ultimately it really does feel simple after you really get a hold on the sensory system and and how to support a child it really isn't that complicated like it's really just a matter of knowing what their needs are and then creating a plan to better support them and how incredible is it that with this plan that's very individualized and very tailored to the child specific needs, we can teach them that now. Like we can have a two year old, three year old, four, five, six, and all of a sudden we are bringing them this information and we are helping them in this way from the time they're so young. Imagine how much of a difference of an impact that would make on their life. And I love sharing the story about Jamie because it's just such a great example of these are not things we learn, right? Like unless we completely go out of our way, they're just not things we learn. Even um, someone who is autistic like her had yet to learn how her sensory system impacted her every day. And now that she knows this, she is able to just completely change the way that she is going to live the rest of her life. So it really is so cool to get to see the impact that this can have on your clients. So again, we are just so grateful to have everyone here and being able to learn all of this because learning these things really can make such a, an impact on your kids. We just want to thank you for being here on day one. We cannot wait for the rest of the week. We hope you found value out of today and we can't wait to jump in and to get you guys set up with a plan to help you with that one client and and come back tomorrow with an update of something you've tried and how it's going so thank you everyone for being here